Uh, good afternoon. Um, welcome to this webinar from Celnex, where we want to talk about when connectivity in health really matters. Uh, why this title, why this webinar? Is because we think it's important nowadays, uh, mostly after the pandemic in uh, COVID-19, to realize the importance of digital world in healthcare. Secondly, to know how these digital services can improve healthcare. After, to see how complex it is to do these changes in healthcare. And finally, to be aware of the importance of working together different kind of professionals. To do this, we have the, the privilege to have three amazing panelists. One of them is Ferran Rodriguez, the other one is Josh Grosken, um, another one is Kuhn Mueller. Ferran is Director of Infra Infrastructure and Biomedical Engineering in Hospital Clinic de Barcelona. Josh is a Program Manager, Domotics, Technology and EOT, EIT, CISA. And Kuhn is Marketing Director, Ulvimo, Cellnex Telecom Consultant for Enterprise Wireless Networks. And that is the, the way to today to, to talk together, to talk to you two, not directly because it's not possible, but we invite you on the course of the, the webinar to send your questions or your comments through the chat of this, uh, this webinar. Please feel free tell us what you want to know or questions. I would like to ask you two, if you have a question particular for one of the, the panelists, please specify that in your message. Okay, um, do you remember uh, when the first um, machines in the banks were there, the machines that to take money, the ATP, ATM, pardon, sorry, long time ago. Do you remember when we start to talk about the digital bank, digital banks in the world? And what happens nowadays? Nobody talks about digital banks because the banks are digital. And digital means they are digital. That means they, not, they don't need to put the label about digital. They are digital as a banks. Healthcare will happen the same because I'm talking now about digital health, but it's only for a while. In the future, will be digital healthcare in itself because we're integrating the digital world. But it's complex. It's more complex than the banking system. And I want to show you two slides. The first slide was the Europe map. In this slide, we see the European um, Union and other countries around the European Union. We have two different systems of healthcare, different ways to, to, to deal with services. But the most important thing is about the way the investment they are in each country in healthcare. Yeah, a huge difference. Later on, we comment. This slide and the next one is part of a white book Cell next way book is about how is nowadays the digital health and how should be in the future. Next slide, please. And we'll see in this white paper uh, is the situation now. And we see the different technologies we have now in the market, into the market, and they are accessible. They are ready to be implemented. They are not at the same level. They are once on some of them, they are more implemented than other ones. That is a problem because we need to change that. We need to be sure that all technologies can help to improve healthcare will be implemented. For this reason, I think we can uh, we can talk now about how we can make this change, how we can go from digital to the hospital uh, healthcare as normal, how we can improve the technologies in healthcare. And for that, I have a first question. The question is, are clinical, clinicians and patients prepared to use digital technologies? Because we cannot go ahead if the protagonists of that, that means doctors, nurses and patients, are not ready to adopt these technologies. For this, for this I ask uh, first to have the, 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 the voice, the opinion of Kuhn to explain to us how do you see how she is this uh, question at this moment. Please, Kuhn. Hello, everybody. My name is Kuhn Mulet. First name is Dutch, surname is French, nothing Spanish in the name, I'm afraid. Um, indeed, I'm the one who uh, wrote the white paper that we're talking about for Cellnex about uh, wireless enablement of uh, health. So the, the white paper that you're currently glancing through on the screen is the one that will, made, will be made available right after the seminar on behalf of Cellnex. 
And in the white paper, we basically make an inventory of all the trends in health, telemedication, robotics, AI, etc. And then we attach or attribute to every one of those trends in health a, an enabling wireless facility or a wireless technology or a wireless infrastructure. So where can wireless technology come to help? We don't pretend that wireless is the sole solution to everything in health. Um, the map that you just saw with all the per capita expenditures on health, um, just to name one figure, and it's pretty alarming. In a Western European country, on average, 10% of the GDP goes into health. That's enormous. And that needs to be controlled. So technology needs to come to rescue, also to control the explosion of, of expenses in health with the aging of our populations. And this is happening in Holland and England and Spain and everywhere. The health expenses are going to well, grow up double probably over the next decade. So we need to control those expenses. And they're also wireless and ICT can play a significant role. Uh, and maybe Jordi, we can go back to the bar chart that Johan was using with the usage of IT. Maybe you can show it in the back. This chart, folks, is pretty alarming as well, right? So IT, look at the, at the top end of the chart. IT is used in, in, uh, in the health sector for like uh, remote prescriptions and online appointments and maybe a bit of a video consult. But if you go to the lower part of the chart, it's bare I, AI, VR, uh, robotics. There's plenty of technologies that are around but are barely being used. So there's tremendous room for improvement. Easy for me to say as a technology, fetishist, but still this chart is pretty explanatory on that. Back to you, Johan. Thank you, Gun. It's very clear, very, uh, very instructive to know what is going on in that with these slides. Now, uh, Josh, what do you think? Clinicians and patients are ready for adopting technologies in the daily work? Yeah, let me first explain a bit about my company. Um, we are a company in healthcare for mentally and physically disabled people. We have about 150 locations and we serve a lot of people who have uh, muscle diseases or brain injuries. Uh, with these people, we always look for the possibilities in their lives to keep them as self-reliant as possible. Uh, we also see that our clients are uh, not super old. They are uh, from child to, uh, to the elderly people. But we also see that they are already used to new technologies. So the question is not, are they prepared to uh, accept the technologies? But mostly those people are asking for technology to use in, in, in taking care of them. So the difficulty for us as a company who gives care is more how to integrate all those technology that is available on the market uh, for, for consumers or, uh, or for businesses. Um, how can we integrate the IoT into our business IT system? So when you Thank see you the video, Thank you it's for also you. about uh, a world of difference. We keep the people uh, in their uh, own strengths and we want to have them as self-reliant as possible. Good answer. I think it's good to know. It's not sometimes there is a kind of um, thinking about saying, OK, Elderly people or people with disabilities cannot manage technology, but you're saying the contrary. That means that these people, in this case, people with this, this condition, they need, they want to have more technology to have a better life. That's great. Now, after two te technologies, let's say, let's go now to the doctor, or doctor or technology too, but in a hospital. Ferran, what do you think? How is going? Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, in our case, uh, concerning if, if uh, professionals or patients are well prepared or not to, to deal with high technology. I would uh, I would suggest to do the same question to yourself. Are you well prepared to use technology at your home with your wife, with your children, with your parents? I think that uh, as far as society has started implementing uh, digital devices, so uh, not to talk about brands, but uh, iPads, laptops, uh, mobile phones. Uh, it, it's it's a daily product. So so let me say they are well prepared. Not only prepared, but too much prepared. Let me say because the people are demanding uh, solutions in the same uh, scale of growing and expectancies that you all have in your private life. 
So nobody can understand to enter inside a hospital, even a very big university hospital, and do not find the same type of solutions, at least, that you have in your living room. OK, so initially everybody was happy having uh, Wi-Fi. OK, it's nice, but OK, Wi-Fi, it's, it's achieved. Uh, what else? No, apart from that, you have uh, automatic ways to track your path inside the hospital. OK, magnificent. What else? Oh, no, no. Then you, you have your medical records implemented with your digital history. OK, magnificent. What else? So the, the speed in which professionals and patients require us for solutions are higher and faster, more than we can develop and implement it. OK, it's back to you, Joan. Thank you very much, uh, Ferran. I think that's a positive note on that. No, I know it's not easy, but it's, it's going on and more and more hospitals are more prone to implement inside the hospital more technologies and more technologies with the patients. The, the other question is, OK, um, but who's paying the whole thing? Because finally, you know, healthcare is a system very expensive sometimes, depending on the country, but it's money at the end of the day. And it's always difficult to invest more money in the system, into the system. Um, <clears throat> Kuhn, what do you think about, do you think the regional governments or national governments, the public health care services are ready to invest money in this area? If indeed it is the government who funds the lion's share of the health system, that is also not the same across countries. Uh, for instance, in Holland, my country, uh, the insurance companies are basically paying for the health uh, services. Well, everybody has a obligatory national health scheme and an insurance. I won't dwell on that, but it's the insurance companies that are basically driving the investment in, uh, in, in new technology, in the case of a country like Holland. Again, back to the previous chart, to be cost effective. I mean, there's an enormous cost effectiveness drive in the, uh, in, in the healthcare system. And also back to your question, Johan, governments should have the same inclination. It's clear that all over Europe, the cost of health are gonna dramatically rise. They're now at like 10% of our GDP. A decade from now, they're going to be in the area of 20%. That is almost out of control. So we're going to need technology. Governments are going to have to impose technology to control the expenses. And of course, Ferran's point, enhance the services to the, uh, and Jos's point, uh, to, the, to the patients. But I think there's a strong drive also from a, from, from a cost efficiency point of view. And to turn that around, many of those investments are pretty affordable. To, and I won't dwell on all the details, but a private GS, oh, sorry, a private LTE system can start at, at a few ten thousands of euros. You're not always talking millions. Cool, thank you. Uh, let me ask a question too. Uh, do you think um, the, is, is not easy to show the, the advantage from the, the economy side? I mean, if you minister in, in Netherlands, Holland, as you say, okay, show me, show me the figures. If I'm doing more telemedicine and doing more remote monitoring patients, do you think how much money can, can save? Mm -hmm. What do you think? How oh. make evident the, 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 the uh, figures in that? I remember, Ferran, you guys in, in health like things to be evidence based, right? Well, there is, I'm not going to say it's evidence, but there's so many researches or experiments that have shown that implementing IT in the proper manner, not just wireless, any IT, can save percentages or multiple tens of percentages on expenses. So there's plenty of, well, evidence, let's say, statistics to substantiate that IT does contribute to cost savings. And apart from cost savings, still improving the life of patients. So let's not forget that aspect, the point that Jos was making. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Jos, what do you think? You are working in a different area, probably. What do you think, uh, how governments have to invest more, 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 more funds to, to help have technologies and like your company to provide services? How do you think the flow of money can help to make things happen? Well, maybe we should ask the question, why should the government invest in all these kinds of technologies? Uh, it's for the benefit of the clients to have a better life. It's for the benefit of the care organizations to make it more efficient. So why can't we make an ecosystem in that kind of uh, solutions? The government is supporting healthcare systems, also in the Netherlands. But when we can use technology and then save one person in healthcare, then we save a lot of money. 
So when we have to invest, uh, say, 10,000 euros, and we can uh, can save uh, 140,000 euros because we don't need one employee um, at our place, why should the government pay for it? So that's that's my question. Um, does the government also have to pay? But some things also are for me as a person uh, very very nice to have. It's not a must. So when I I can put the gir curtains with a, a a button and they close, that's for me. And as a normal uh, man in my own ho home, I also have to pay for it. So why does the system have to pay for that kind of technology? Good question, George. Uh, I like this the, the way you you explain that because it's true. We have we are dying from success. No, uh, European countries uh, with all the welfare system has been fantastic making things happen. And you compare systems now and 50 years ago, it's nothing to do, nothing, it's totally different because there's been a lot of investment. But still, there is a kind of blockage in the minds of people. Everything should be free. And in some countries, they have co-payment of these kind of things. It's so difficult to implement in other countries. Anyway, that is a, a follow-up question. But thank you, Josh, for your insight in this item. Uh, listen, uh, now, Ferran, from another perspective to the Hospital Clinic de Barcelona, what do you think? How how the regional governments, or, or why, why they have to invest more money to have more technology in order to improve healthcare services? Ferran. Okay, and uh, nowadays, the, the sustainability and affordability of the public health sector, it's highly compromised, okay? So, for sure, for sure, some solutions should be implemented in order to, to correct that. Um, one of them could be maybe the most important one, at least for, for me, it's my opinion, it's shift the traditional way in which uh, we have um, been trained to determine which product, which solution, it's the proper one to be implemented in health sector. And this is traditionally done by public tendering processes in, in, in which uh, we select, uh, as I told you, products and services based upon uh, physical parameters, the length, the weight, the amount of bats, the electrical power consume, things that can be easily measured. So if you have a product or solution that has better parameters in the future than your competitors, maybe your solution is the best. Okay, if the money it's the correct one. But this is not the proper way. The proper way should be measuring the value that the solution uh, gives to all the health sector, not the cost that it imposes to your own institution. Let me explain a little bit. Inside the health sector, there are a lot of different institutions, um, mostly separated, at least in Spain. So uh, primary attendance is different than hospitals. Hospitals are different from social services and they are different from elderly people centers and completely independent from pharmacists and of course completely independent to the cost that you're assuming in your house when your parent is returning home and you must uh, keep uh, taking care of him or her during long periods of time. So the cost is distributed about, about uh, different institutions with different uh, budgets, with different aims, with different goals, and also in the traditional way. So if someday that should be very close, we understand that all the health sector, it means all the costs, the addition of all of them, the cost of the pharma drug plus the cost of a nurse plus uh, uh, the cost of, I don't know, the maintenance of the device plus the cost of yourself asking for a day of permission at your job to take care of your daughter. OK, all these costs are affecting the health. So solutions in which you can join the costs and the value, the returned value in all this complex environment are mandatory. And this today cannot be achieved without technology. So there are two ways to improve sustainability. One is improve the procedures, protocols, and whatever we are going to discuss today inside our centers. And the other one, the most attractive one is control and also select the best solutions that can make the whole system affordable for everybody.
Okay, so technology is there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's good. Thank you because you are, in a way, um, framing the next question. Because uh, I think, as you said, the question is not to put technology, piling technology in a hospital or a medical center. It is about how we use technology. And that means that the only way to do it properly is how we transform healthcare. And that's the, the, the magic word, no? Say we're not trying to, to make more uh, technology to do things. We need technology to do things better, faster and safer. That is the, the mantra, no? Yeah. But anyway, that is the question, the question now. Um, to start again, but Kuhn, um, you have experience, you are um, a man knowing well the, the sector. Uh, I, I'm asking well, how we can accelerate this process. Because before I talk about talking about the bank, banking system, not as a model itself, but as an as example, there have been quite a, a, a years to, 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 to reach the point they are now. But they starting very low and now they are very, very integrated. How do you think how we can accelerate this process to transform healthcare services? Kun, up to you. Yeah, maybe your ATM, Johan, is, is a good or also a bad example, whichever way you want to put it, because the first ATMs were implemented 50 years ago. Eh? So it took us 50 years to get where we are today, where indeed on every corner of every street, there's an ATM and everybody knows how to use an ATM. So that took a couple of decades, I guess, in, in health, we can't afford to take that many decades. So one of the one of the things that definitely needs to happen, and this is a task for, for the providers and, and, and also Celnex to make technology a commodity. In, in technology markets, the word commodity often has a, has, a, has a negative connotation, but I think commodity is precisely where you want it to be. Like an ATM is a commodity, you just use it without wondering how it works. So a lot of the technology we can provide to help facilitate health processes needs quicker commoditization. It needs to become simpler, uh, more standardized, uh, run of the mill. All the terms that you could look upon as negative, I think they're positive. If implementing a private wireless network or a, an in-building wireless system that you've, you're in the brink of implementing your, in your care institute is a click of a mouse and you can choose from multiple players, the technology is known, the standards are there, uh, vendors know what to do, Celnex can, impl can implement it. Actual fact, that's where we need to go. I still think as a technology consultant, many of these solutions are still too a little bit cumbersome and a little bit complex. So a definite task is to make them commodity in the positive sense of the word. Okay, thank you. Um, that is a, a, good, a very, very nice answer to the question. Um, let's let's see now how Josh has opinion on that, how he sees the, the way to accelerate this process of healthcare transformation. Josh. Yes, well, uh... I also agree to Kuhn, uh, uh, infrastructure should be available. That should not be uh, uh, some kind of uh, uh, wall that you have to, to, to cross. Um, you also uh, have to have the guts to implement and uh, not wait and also uh, make it uh, evidence-based or whatever. Maybe you should just do it. Uh, when we look at teams in the last year, it was an enormous uh, innovation in healthcare. We can use teams. We now have uh, remote uh, uh, doctor visits. Uh, so that's not just because we have investigated how can we use it, because we already know about 10 or 15 years that we can use video calls. But now we had to do it and it worked. So we, I think we have to have the guts to just do it, to make it proof um, and uh, not to hesitate. Maybe also the, the financial part who has to pay for it. Maybe we should, we should just create some kind of uh, co-creation with uh, with the, the finance companies or the, the, the government. We are going to do this. And when we are uh, one year further, then we discuss about costs. Uh, also, a second point is privacy also is a thing which is also making it go slower. But when I was in a hospital uh, 10 years ago or in a care organization 10 years ago, my nurse went into my room. My my files were on the table. Everybody could look in, in the files. And now when we make it digital, we make a lot of problems about it. We have to say it's private. It's who can look in my uh, my data. Uh, but when we go back in the, in, the, in the past, that was not an issue. 
So maybe we should make a, a yeah, practical view on privacy uh, to implement all these kind of stuff. Thank you, Josh. You are very pragmatic. I like that. Be pragmatic because it needs pragmatism this moment to make things happen. Do it. No, let's do it. Yeah. Let's do it. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. And now, Ferran, what do you think from your experience? How you see the way to transform healthcare in a better way or faster way, in a way? Ferran, up to you. Okay. Uh, I think that the most important thing for me could be to open our market to different type of companies. So it's a, it's a market, a very mature market, let me say, in terms of at least medical technology. And this market, it's distributed among a few core of leader companies. And they are very well aware and they know perfectly what happens with, uh, with the health sector. Um, we know our past, we know our present, but the world, it's plenty of incredibly huge uh, companies, corporations, much more skilled in digital matters, for example, that they are not used to work with, with the health. And we have the, the false image that it's a very well restricted sector in which it's hard to enter, hard to maintain. And part of that is true, but it's not hard to enter. What it's uh, difficult is to understand perfectly the particularities of our system. It's a, it's a system in which, as uh, Joss has already explained, the privacy is particularly, particularly strict, but no much than in a bank, okay? It's an area in which cybersecurity matters and matters very much, but not more than in a nuclear central. And it's an area in which we have a huge amount of devices from different brands and models changing year by year in public tender processes. So it means that it's hardly to standardize anything but we have not much devices that uh, any uh, automotive industry have in a single factory, I don't know, in Wolfsburg, okay? We are not much than that, but the specialists uh, are there and we have our own specialists and our own companies specialized in health, they have their own interests, okay? Because they control this market a long time ago and they do not want to lose that control. OK, so first thing for me, open the market and help from from the health sector, other type of companies, maybe not introduced in health to make things easier to enter here and recognize our job and understand what we expect from them. This this could be for me the, the most important thing. The second one, it's already explained by Jos and Kuhn, uh, shift the current solutions that they are super niche, very specific for a single group of investigators. They are particular, particularized for a single illness, for a certain type of passions that are surrounding the center only 50 kilometers. Okay, so at, at far we have thousands of solutions and we try to turn that in a commodity. This is the word. Once solution became a commodity and not a specific research project multiplied by thousands, then we are talking this 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 language. We can arrive to to very nice things. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Ferran. I could agree more what you said. I could, I, could I comment on what Ferran is saying? Yes, please. I, I often come across consultants have all these proverbs. I I often call this point that Ferran is addressing this quote unquote, perceived uniqueness of one's own sector. Every sector is inclined to perceive itself as unique. Health is unique, car manufacturer is unique, petrochemical is unique. At the end of the day, it's only partially unique. Look at other sectors, open up to other sectors, see what Volkswagen has done in Wolfsburg, to what extent that can help your hospital. You're this right. The point that you and I discussed, Ferran, eh? at IoT or, or making a building smart, it's not terribly different from a hospital or an office. Mm. So open up, look, look across fences. Yeah, this is a nice example, Kuhn, sorry to, to appear again. Uh, RFID, when, when RFID tried to implement hardly in hospital sector, let me say that it was something about nine years ago, nine to ten years ago. At that time, 
this technology it's considered nearly obsolete by, by the European Commission. By that time, this technology it's been removed from the automotive industries that had used that intensively for 25 years. And at that moment, it was presented as the newest thing for health. So this is this is quite common. I have talked about RFID, but we can talk about whatever you want. Traditionally, Mm, transversal technologies and non-specific medical ones do enter in health sector much, much, much uh, late than in the rest of sectors. And this doesn't make things easier for us, particularly. Ferran, uh, th thank yeah, you. I think let me react on, uh, on Ferran again. Sorry, sorry. Um, it makes, maybe it makes it not, not much, much more easier, but we also can use all the, the, the um, uh, the use lessons uh, from all those implementations. So the loan worker proposition uh, on, on the sea or in a, a town um, also is used in care organizations at this point for our clients who uh, from which we want to know if they leave the building. But the use lessons from uh, the, the other sectors uh, are very useful by implementing it to our companies. Mm. Uh, that's great. I think that is, I put a question now because uh, when you're talking about, I was thinking about the 5G and Ferran knows well in Hospital Clinic Barcelona, two years ago, uh, when is the Mobile World Congress, when the 5G was starting to be real, was the first operation, the surgical operation in the world. I don't know if it's true or not, but that was said this way. Uh, when a, a, a surgeon made an operation uh, a distance uh, using 5G technology. Could you explain more that, Ferran? Okay, <laughs> this is, uh, Juan, this is a very nice example. Um, I'm not expert on that field, but uh, uh, as far as I know, in my understanding, um, to make things very easy, uh, today with uh, COVID, uh, nearly everybody has uh, tasted what does it mean teleworking, okay? Uh, forget hospitals, teleworking. You are working at your home magnificent with your laptop and nothing happens, okay? Nothing happens. This may be to happen in hospitals. We, without COVID, we would need to wait for 10 years more. Who knows, maybe five, maybe seven, but it happened, okay? But in fact, teleworking was previous to medical teleconsultation because it's a step uh, farther. And medical consultation, maybe it's a step farther than telemedicine. And telemedicine is a little bit more easier than remote patient monitoring. And remote patient monitoring, it's much more simpler than remote diagnostics. And remote diagnostics, it's a game compared with remote interventionist. It means surgical, robotics, directly applied in a patient that is being operated. So, in the mobile, it was demonstrated that even the hardest scenario, it means to operate a patient in real time, it's, it can be achieved. Uh, technology is there. So what happened with the rest that are terribly easier? Okay, what happened is that we are a slow adopted solutions. We do not have this commodity appliances well developed. Well, what happened is that our interlocutors in terms of uh, technology uh, do consider that health is too particular to implement generalistic solutions. And we are lost somewhere between the telemedicine and the patient remote uh, um, patient monitoring. And we will not advance further with if we do not jump over these these forced uh, barriers. So mobile demonstrated that they can be solved. Mobile demonstrated that even the hardest uh, solution can be perfectly implemented. So why not to implement the software? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and and indeed, the one that, that you're now addressing, Johan, remote surgery. So yes. theoretically with the patient in Spain and the doctor operating in China, being yes. a specialist on some operation, that is often advocated as the most demanding application. Yes, yes, That's exactly. True. Exactly. Same than telementoring. Maybe you are operating, your surgeon is here, just in front of you, just half a meter over you, but maybe he or she doesn't have the proper skills to decide something. 
So telementoring, it means that somebody more skilled than you, maybe located 10,000 miles away from the surgical table, can give you just on time some proper indications. This is as much important or more than directly do control the medical device from the distance. OK, thank you. The technology I to know, support sorry, that sorry, is sorry, readily sorry. available that imposes performances that we can deliver today that we can deliver with 5G, we can even deliver with LTE, all of that. Back to, to Jos's point, I, I would say just get started. It's all there, it can all be yeah, done. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, sorry, a question. Uh, I said at the beginning, if uh, the audience have questions or comments, please send your comments and questions to the chat. And after we try to, before finishing the session, trying to answer your questions, please. OK, that is getting interesting, no? getting um, very challenging. Because um, the, one of the things, uh, strange things, but it's sometimes fake news or, or is similar. Um, there are some people thinking, OK, the medicine won't be the same. Technology is a way to make medicine less human. What do you think? Up to you, uh, what, which you can talk about, because it's true, some people think and some doctors do. I think some some doctors, some um, nurses think, OK, I'm a doctor, I'm a nurse. And I, I, why do I need technology? I, I have my, my profession. I'm good, good what I'm doing. What I have to add technology is a way to lose the human sight, the, the human touch. One of you, tell answer, please. Well, let me start. Um, technology for our clients means uh, it's, it's a kind of a must. Um, technology is part of their self-reliance. Uh, it keeps them uh, self-reliance. They don't have to go to, uh, an, uh, in, to an institution. They can stay at home. And that's so important for people to do their own things. And it's so important to, um, to, to control your own home uh, and not to ask a, a person to help to close the, the, the curtains or to, to, to do anything in the home. So when technology is part of your life and it helps you to keep self reliance, well, I think that's a normal situation. So it's not a dehumanizing or whatever. It's it's part of the new system. Good, I like that because I think we have to, to send this message. Technology as usual, to all technology from a knife, no? A knife can be a dangerous, a dangerous tool in hands of somebody. But a knife is a very useful tool for our daily lives. I mean, technology in itself is neutral, is how you use things. But if you're doing technology in the right way, with the guidelines for ethics and the protection of uh, data, I think should be, people have to change the mind and be more confident. Um, other comments on that question of the humanization of the medicine, of deshumanization of the medicine? I, I think you, you raised the right point, Johan. Technology is neutral. Technology facilitates. And you could theoretically misuse it to make a treatment or a care process completely inhuman hide everything behind firewalls and screens and cell surface portals and make the patient feel like a number, you could if you want to use it the wrong way. But technology basically enables, it, it helps, for instance, a doctor to spend his time on the contact with the patient rather than spending hours behind the screen scrutinizing, uh, I don't know what images, for instance, looking for something that AI could have found much, much easier. So it's either way. You can also use it to actually humanize uh, help more to liberate nurses and doctors from time consuming work that an AI or a system could have done better. The repetitive tasks that they hate doing. Yes, 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 I, I agree. There, there is one one fact, one word that I, I like very much. It's empathy. So, so you, you a, a machine uh, can cannot uh, be placed in the position of the passion. Uh, a machine maybe cannot understand the relationship between you and your familiars or parents. A machine maybe cannot understand and it's not willing to understand if you feel comfortable or non-comfortable in a certain moment with a decision or a communication that you receive and how to process that uh, to you with your proper language and 
not in a pre-programmed language, this capability to adapt to every uh, circumstance, to every um, um, prevented moment or situation. This is particular for humans. And apart from that, at least uh, for me, uh, brain is the most sophisticated machine that does do exist in the world. OK, uh, you can train a machine to play chess very well, and even this machine can win like uh, Deep Blue. I think that it was called Deep Blue can win the best uh, player of chess, but it's quite easy in a hospital to link brains. How much brains do you want to be linked? Uh, so just join 10 doctors in front of a patient and let them discuss the medical case. Um, it takes some minutes to arrive to decisions, maybe half an hour if it's a complex case. Try to link 10 machines with their systems of programming, their brands, their models, their data. That it's impossible. So there are things that can be easily done by machines and future is that. And they are things that will never be done. And we must understand that uh, machines will be uh, help. Nothing more than that. Uh, I can give you an example. We have talked about the um, surgical robotics and everybody because we have seen films can imagine a robot that automatically is operating you. True or false? Let's see what happened. But I have never seen a film and I'm willing to do that in which the robot simply remove your dirty diapers when you have make pee in the bed and clean your bottom and remove your pants. OK, and maybe a passion prefer than a robot and non uh, nice man or a nice lady enters in the room, see their intimate parts um, clean that with a gauss because they are extremely um, resigned to what happened and maybe a robot can do that okay maybe a robot can do that and it's yeah. better for passions okay it's an example thank you, okay. thank you for running thank you um sorry i I'm, I'm now i think it's important to follow what fran said now uh we have three questions from the audience and I think it's we have time to do it. I think it's very important. Uh, let me tell you that the, the, the first question is a question to all. It's not a particular uh, a panelist. Is among the different digital technologies you were referring at the beginning of this meeting, which ones do you believe will have a sooner and massive adoption? What do you think? Which ones are the more urgent to implement? Okay. Maybe your turn. Yeah, well, um, in, in in healthcare, uh, we we studied, uh, for example, people with um, um, uh, muscle diseases, Duchenne, ALS, uh, and that kind of diseases. Uh, how how nice would it be if they could go out on the street, be informed about uh, the status of their health uh, supporting system, their machine on their uh, wheelchair? And if it says, well, your battery is about 10%, uh, you should go home. And at this point, you will be uh, on time to get home. So the surgery can help you when you are at home. So they can make their own choice and they also can decide to drive further on and maybe go to, to the parents because they live only five minutes away. Uh, so when they have a full time connectivity with the machine, to also the, the system we use in our healthcare organization. They are in their own, uh, they can decide on their own because of the information they get from the system to do whatever they want to do. So which technology, I think mobile technology will, uh, will go further than Wi-Fi at this point. Because nowadays we have to stay in our home or close to our home to get the connectivity we have um, and we would love to see that those kind of people can do what they want to do, can decide what they want to decide. Thank you, George. On other opinions, somebody else wants to jump in? I guess it makes sense for health to jumpstart with those technologies that are most likely to commoditize fast. So back to Ferran's point, the technologies that are being used across verticals, that are being used in factories and petrochemical and health and et cetera, so that you basically benefit from all the massive developments that are taking place also in other sectors. I think AI is a good example. AI is being used in video scrutiny and health, in 
uh, machine learning in factories. So their health can benefit dramatically from, well, the intelligence that's being developed in other sectors. And, and definitely another one is wireless technology, 4 and 5G. It's being implemented across the world. There's billions of users of it. The technology is completely standardized and commoditized, which is a great benefit. So it becomes terribly affordable. There's companies like Cellnex and others that can implement it for you. So back to commoditization, those are the, com the technologies that are rapidly commoditizing, which is very beneficial for health. You can just use it. It's there. It's known. It's, it's no black magic anymore. Okay, thank you. Um, Juan, uh, give right. me one, one second. In, in my opinion, um, I, I have some doubt between the remote passion monitoring and the uh, artificial intelligence enabled decision support systems and who win who will win this this race uh, let's say that it depends on how the current health system must suffer the adoption let me say if a solution it's only technology dependent it's much easier that it's well implemented. If the introduction of this solution force the system to readapt, redesign, reconfigure the type of professionals, the amount of specialists, how the health is even delivered at your house. So it's a change of paradigm that and not the technology makes things slower. Thank you, Ferran. Another question is, uh, which is from your point of view, the principal challenge for the transition to digital of the healthcare industry? Only one, the most important one. Difficult question for you, up to you. Yeah, can I start? Yes, please. I, I, like, I know that you guys in, in, in health like things to be evidence-based. Well, I have a bit of evidence here, unfortunately. There was a research recently, and I got the research right, uh, right here. I was looking at it this morning. What is the biggest burden to implementing new technologies in health? Uh, sorry to say, guys, uh, bureaucracy. That came out as the leading hindrance, the leading stumbling block into implementation. Not technology, not readiness to adopt, not willingness of nurses, but bureaucracy. <laughs> uh, it's not me saying it. It was a research from the European Union. That's good to know. I think that's well, good to know. Well, maybe not so good to know, but <laughs> yeah, something yeah. we need to work on. <laughs> <laughs> Difficult job. Anyway, that's good. <laughs> the, another opinion from from, my, from you, Ferrano and Josh, on this question. Yeah, in, in also uh, uh, talking about Kuhn's point, uh, you also do so, so. You need to find people who are willing to to make the system change. So the, the, it's it's good to. Uh, to know that the bureaucracy is the problem or is slowing it down. So why can we uh, get a lot of people who are, uh, are willing to, to make it happen on another way? That's a good, George. I think the, the name is to have a critical mass, a critical mass where people decide. No? One, yeah. one thing, allow me. Um, um, you know, um, in the last 10 years, from get, having ties, no, the dressing the men and ties. Now nobody has a tie, no, and it's a critical mass. I think if I'm going to a meeting with a tie, uh, sometimes I think it's strange, no. That means I don't have that, a tie. Easy <laughs> 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 <It's> exception. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. I, I am ashamed, so and I'm not going anymore with tie because I feel it's strange. Well, you know, when ten years or five years ago I was in the problem. That means it's a critical mass, and, and that could be applied not for the ties or for, for fashion or, or dressing. Is uh, about the ma the people, the critical mass to push that. Anyway, that was a comment. Uh, somebody else, Fran, you want to tell uh, your challenge? You, what is the the bigger challenge you see in this uh, implementation of technology? Please. Uh, I'm sorry, but I will select two, one technological and one from other sides. From the other sides, uh, I would agree with uh, Kuhn, for example, in the in the major acceptance by the clinical uh, community. It means, uh, meanwhile, the solutions are niched and specifically de developed based on a project or a publication or something like that, they, they will not be massively introduced. So initially, the, the medical community must accept those solutions uh, and obtain this critical mass that you, Juan, were explaining. And from the technical side, for me, it's the cyber security. Okay, very few people, very few people, especially specifically with uh, technology suppliers, uh, do analyze 
uh, well enough the relevance of this matter inside uh, inside the health sector. It and it's not just by the risk of uh, stalling your medical data that sorry uh, it has no interest but it's the ability to enter inside uh, public institutions and block machines and uh, erase files and do harmful uh, effects just to obtain some some money for that and there are people that professionally and not few people thousands of people surrounding the world that they professionally are trying to use those systems uh, net connected systems to to find ways to enter inside the the health uh, nets okay and and this is a, a quite huge bridge specifically for for prototype solutions that do not have those features correctly developed okay good good two questions very important challenges the, the other question is is the what will be the key drivers for health use use cases particularly with 5g will be will be it be push or pull if your question uh, it's clear a question. I, can, I can't repeat to you one. Mm -hmm. What will be the key drivers for health use cases, particular, particular with 5G? Will be, will we be push or pull? Today, uh, let's start go. for me. At this particular moment, uh, I think that we need a little bit uh, push. More yeah. than pull, yes. Okay. Yeah, I also think that, that it depends on from which side you look at it. Will it be a push from the clients or patient side, or will it be a push from the organization and government side? Mm -hmm. what, what will be the ideal situation? I think that the clients, especially in, in the care institutions, they will push it to our organizations. So we have to react on their needs. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. OK, um, we have five minutes. I don't know if you have more questions to, from the audience, but perhaps as a, a final question for you is just we talked some some minutes ago about security and, and safety, cyber, cyber attacks. Um, Ferran, you are in the, in the safe door. You are, you are the safe thing, uh, having the clinic uh, safe. Sorry. Um, what do you think, what message we can give to the to the users, doctors and nurses and patients about how safe the systems are nowadays in European countries, but in your hospital, of course, but in general? Because I think sometimes people are afraid to get too much technology and we are not sure what happens to technology. Can you explain a little how do you can, let's say, assure the people that things are done in the proper way? Okay, like like an example, in a medium big sized uh, hospital like mine, uh, we have something about 7000 workers and something about 900 beds to have a reference. It's not a very big hospital, it's simply big, not very big. We have approximately 9000 uh, medical devices. From those 9000 medical devices, let me say that approximately 2000 of them can be can be directly today connected to the net it doesn't mean that we have them connected to the man, the net eh? but they can be today if we add those 2000 medical devices to approximately 3000 industrial operative devices it means readers antennas um, rfid uh, detectors sensors of temperature codecs from video conferences doesn't matter 3000 scadas of maintenance uh, video cameras of safety and security uh, we have 2000 uh, medical devices connectable now 3000 uh, industrial devices already connected if not they do not work and apart from that, we have something about 4,000 IT devices. It means laptops, computers, uh, uh, working stations, uh, iPads, mobiles uh, with uh, smartphone fun functionality. So 4,000 plus 3,000 plus 2,000, it's very close to 10,000 devices. Maybe from, let me say, 600 different brands and models. Who can control that? 
uh, is absolutely uncontrollable. So the only way to control how things uh, are connected, which type of data they interchange, is putting very strong firewalls, very, very strong uh, VLANs, um, implementing policies that forces us not to connect devices, even they have been designed to be connected. So our internal policies forces us to go against the technology. This is a particularity of the health sector. OK, and this will not be solved till there are some industrial solutions that help us to control that. OK, with medical devices, they are, let me say they are trying to be auto protected. With IT, we have commercial solutions to be implemented. OK, antivirus. OK, but with industrial devices, solutions are not so easy. Thank you, Ferran. That means you you can we can relax, no? We, you, and people like you doing the job, we can can be confident things are going well despite the challenge you have. But before leaving the, the webinar, uh, jo, uh, Kun, Josh, you want to have a final say, and Ferran, of course. Well, I, I I would like to comment a bit about uh, what Ferran was saying. Um, in our in our organization, we also had to, to make the transformation between IT and OT and integrate them so that we had the IoT devices connected to the IT infrastructure. Uh, normally, the IT, IT infrastructure is very well secured, um, but the yeah. OT is not secured or a bit secured. So we changed uh, in our plan to integrate all these kind of systems. We uh, kind of used a whitelisting what was necessary to connect devices into our IT infrastructure. Mm -hmm so that uh, we permit certain devices to connect uh, and if you are not uh, if a device is not in that category it will not connect so okay. we used the it ot integration and we also uh, respected the the it security guidelines but we made them a bit uh, 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 greater so the ot devices also could connect okay thank you thank you josh kun uh, yes, to, to summarize, as what, what we're going to present in the white paper that the audience will get in a couple of days after the seminar is that there's a hell of a lot of facilitating technology. There's no shortage of technology. We got abundance of technology. So I would recommend the health sector to concentrate, not to dwell on the technology as such questions like, do we need 5G? In all honesty, I'm a 5G enthusiast, but that for you as a health sector, that's an irrelevant question. Concentrate on your user requirements, your needs, your processes, your security, your density of devices, your traceability. Articulate those demands and approach your vendors and providers, Celnex and others, and pose those questions because they will have that technology. It's already there. Maybe apart from remote surgery, the very most demanding ones, but most of the health applications can be dealt with. But concentrate on your user requirements. And that's difficult enough, eh? articulating or, or writing down your user requirements and parameterizing them. So putting numbers to them, that's tough enough. And then leave it to the market to come up with those facilitating technologies of which there are already so many and so many more developing. And we're already talking 6G now in our market, in, in telecoms. It goes so fast. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kun. On this note, uh, I think we have to close this uh, webinar, this seminar, I think has been amazing to, to see different ways uh, to look at the situation in healthcare, the potential, and how companies like Celnex can be very useful to accelerate the transformation of healthcare. I hope so. I hope so. the more is part of the critical mass, the more companies involved, the more companies pushing for more services, that means it's great. And of course, I would like to say a big thank you. All three panelists has been really great to share with you. This 60 minutes uh, is a way to see how you are concerned, how you are working, how you are helping the things happen. OK, thank you for being there, for your insights, for your, your talk. And of course, uh, thank you to all audience who have been following us. I hope has been good for you for to understand better the challenges in healthcare from the transformation of from digital. And hoping that the, the next time when we talk, we can see the progress made in the healthcare system and our citizens and patients have better life and better health. Thank you very much.